The economic rise of China is one of the most important developments of the 21st century and has a profound impact on the global political order. In 2016, China overtook the United States as the largest economy on Earth when you measure its GDP, that is all of the goods and services produced in the economy, and when you use the measurement purchasing power parity, which adjusts for the differences in the costs of products in each country and the strength of the local currency. And as of 2023, China made up 19% of the entire world economy, whereas the United States only made up around 15%. And the US share of the world economy is shrinking over time, whereas China's share of the world economy is growing. This is an absolutely historic transition. However, when you look at the GDP of a country, it's a very blunt measurement. It doesn't tell you much about the composition of the economy. So in some ways, a better way to measure the economy of a country is not simply its size through all of the goods and services produced in GDP, but rather its share of global manufacturing. And here you can see how China's economic growth is even more impressive because China has become the world's manufacturing superpower, representing more than one third of the entire world's gross production of manufacturing goods. That's to say that China now produces more than the United States, Japan, Germany, India, South Korea, Italy and France combined. In a bit more, I'll explain some of this data for people who might be confused so you can better understand what this means. But the main point to take away here is that China has become the world's manufacturing superpower. And today I'm going to be looking at research that was published by a mainstream economist in Europe named Richard Baldwin. And he published a research paper at a European think tank, which is funded by multiple European governments and banks. So this is a very mainstream think tank. It's not in any way pro-China. And in this research paper, he argued that China is now the world's sole manufacturing superpower. He pointed out that the United States is the world's sole military superpower. The U.S. spends more on its military than the next 10 largest military spenders combined. That is, the U.S. spends more on its military than Ukraine, Japan, South Korea, France, Germany, the U.K., Saudi Arabia, India, Russia and China all combined. And in 2022, the United States alone represented nearly two fifths of the entire world's military expenditure, 39 percent compared to China representing just 13% of world military spending and Russia representing only 4%. So earlier I mentioned that GDP is not always the best way to measure an economy because it includes all forms of economic activity, including things like military spending. But if you go back to this research paper on how China has become the world's sole manufacturing superpower, it points out that while the United States is the world's sole military superpower, China now represents more manufacturing production than the next nine largest manufacturers combined. I think this is the perfect way to understand the difference between the US and China. The US leads the world in military spending, in waging wars that destroy lives and destroy economies, whereas China leads the world in economic production, in manufacturing, of goods that people around the world need to have a better life. Now let's go back to this chart here that shows how China has become the world's manufacturing superpower. Now the chart measures Chinese manufacturing in two different ways, in terms of gross production and in terms of production value added. What does this mean? Well, Chinese gross production is the total sales of all of the Chinese manufacturers. So China represents 35% of the total sales of global manufacturing. However, value added is the gross production of Chinese manufacturers. And then you subtract the intermediate goods used in order to produce those goods. So when you look at China's value added share of world manufacturing, 
it is slightly lower at 29%, but that is still absolutely massive. It is nearly twice the size of US manufacturing value added, which is only 16% of the entire world. So if you adjust for value added production, China represents roughly the same share of global manufacturing of the following countries combined. The United States, Japan, Germany, South Korea, India, Italy, France, and Great Britain. Now, in this study, this economist who teaches at a university in Switzerland, he noted that, quote, China's industrialization is unprecedented. The last time the king of the manufacturing hill got knocked off the throne, it was when the United States surpassed the United Kingdom just before World War I. It took the U.S. the better part of a century to rise to the top, whereas the China-U.S. switch only took about 15 or 20 years. Therefore, he wrote, China's industrialization, in short, defies comparison in world history. When you consider how extremely poor China was several decades ago, this economic development is absolutely amazing. Before the revolution in China in 1949, the average life expectancy of a Chinese person was around 35 or 36 years. In 2020, China overtook the United States and has a higher life expectancy now of 78 years. The Chinese government has implemented the most successful poverty reduction program in world history. The Chinese government has helped to lift 800 million people out of poverty. And according to World Bank data, China alone represents nearly three quarters of the entire world's extreme poverty reduction since 1981. Now, when you point out that China now has the world's largest economy, Critics of China often point out that, yes, it may be true that China's economy is larger than the U.S. economy, but when you measure its GDP per capita, adjusting for the size of the enormous Chinese population, you can see that China is still just a middle-income country, and it's not nearly as wealthy per capita as the advanced economies, the rich economies in the global north and the west, like the United States and European economies, although, of course, those economies developed through colonialism and slavery and war, whereas China's development has been peaceful. So if you want to adjust for the size of the population and look at GDP per capita, it's better to compare apples to apples and not apples to oranges. It's better to compare China's economic growth to that of other poor countries, developing countries in the global south. And if you do so, you can see that in 1990, China's GDP per capita was lower than that of Haiti, Sudan, Honduras, India, and the Philippines. These are among the poorest countries in the world. However, in the past 30 years, China's GDP per capita has skyrocketed and is now several times larger than all of those countries. So how did China do this? It's, it's one thing to look at the statistics and, and see how impressive they are, but what does it actually mean tangibly? How did China develop economically so quickly? Well, the answer, of course, is related to what I was discussing at the beginning of this analysis today. It is because China has established itself as the world's manufacturing superpower. I'm working on a lengthy article that explains China's unique socialist system, which China officially refers to as a socialist market economy and also socialism with Chinese characteristics. In this article, which is very long, I explain how with the reform and opening up that began in 1978 under Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping, the Communist Party of China did not abandon socialism. They allowed market reforms, but they still maintained a unique socialist model. It's very different from the Soviet model, but it is still a socialist model. I explain in the article, I'm going to give you a sneak peek today, and I'm going to show the part in which I detail the main points of the Chinese developmental model, how China has implemented this world historic development and become the world's manufacturing superpower. And we can see that it is largely through state-led industrial development. So let me explain some of the policies that China has used. 
The most important is that the Chinese government has always maintained state-owned enterprises, that is SOEs, that have public ownership of the natural monopolies. So infrastructure, transportation, energy, metalworking, mining, telecommunications. The most important sectors of the economy, known as the commanding heights, have remained publicly owned by the government and they make up at least a third of GDP. Some scholars have estimated up to potentially two thirds of GDP. And these massive state owned enterprises reduce the overall costs of production, which increase the competitiveness of exports in the manufacturing sector. And therefore, by exporting, China was able to get access to foreign currencies, mainly dollars, which it needed for further capital investment to buy technology to move up the value chain of production. More on that in a bit. China has also always maintained state-owned banks. The finance sector has always been socialized and China has used the massive state-owned banks in order to direct credit to the real economy, not to bubbles of speculation. The four largest banks on earth are Chinese state-owned banks and they have given very favorable loans to develop strategic industries in China. Now, this is very similar to the model that was implemented by Japan when Japan became a significant manufacturing power. The economic historian Chalmers Johnson showed in his famous book on Japan's economic development and in particular on its industrial policy carried out by its Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MITA, Chalmers Johnson showed how at its peak period of development in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Japan moved up the global industrial chain through significant state intervention in the economy. And it he described Japan's economic model as, quote, the best example of a state-guided market system currently available. He described this ministry, MITI, as the leading state actor in the economy and he explained how many economists often denied it but the reality is that the japanese state played an absolutely fundamental role in this technological development it was not simply the free markets that led countries like japan to develop and it's certainly not the free market that led china to develop another important state policy that china implemented that japan had also implemented was known as window guidance. The Japanese Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, basically was an arm of the Treasury Ministry and was used to implement fiscal policy, not only monetary policy, and it was used to support industrial policy, to develop industry in Japan. And the Central Bank of Japan guided loans to strategic industries in order to develop Japan's technology sector. And this is exactly what China has done as well, except China has done it through state-owned banks. In Japan, the banks were not state-owned, but it was the central bank that pressured the private banks to, to supply credit to strategic industries. In the case of China, the central bank, which is called the People's Bank of China, collaborated closely with the large state-owned banks, in particular the top four, which really are the major players in China's banking system. But the People's Bank of China also collaborated with smaller banks and local banks, some of which were joint stock commercial banks, in order to direct loans at very favorable low interest rates in order to develop strategic industries. In fact, economists at the Japanese Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, published a white paper back in 2010 in which these Japanese Central Bank economists discussed the similarities of the window guidance policy used by Japan and the window guidance policy used by the Chinese government. The Japanese economists wrote that there was, quote, evidence of the recent policy of window guidance demonstrating its effectiveness in China. However, they pointed out that in the 1980s, as Japan moved toward neoliberalism and financialized and liberalized its economy, this undermined the effectiveness of window guidance. And those neoliberal policies that Japan adopted in the 80s and 90s led to the creation of a bubble economy. And when that bubble burst in Japan, 
Japan went through what was known as the lost decade. And in many ways, Japan's economy has never recovered from that transition toward neoliberalism and financialization, which of course go hand in hand. So this is a very interesting historical example of some of the similarities in the East Asian development model. And it was not only through things like window guidance and monetary policy and bank policy, but also industrial policy. Like in Japan, China maintained a massive industrial policy that gave state support in, in the form of subsidies and investments and tax breaks, etc., to strategic industries. And that's how China moved up the industrial chain. The South Korean development economist Ha Jun Chang has shown in multiple books, like for instance, Kicking Away the Ladder, how countries that developed large industry did so invariably through significant state intervention in the economy. It was not simply by freeing the market, this ridiculous neoliberal propaganda. He shows very clearly in his research how the United States, Western European countries, Japan, they all developed through significant protectionist policies, including tariffs. They developed through supporting industries through industrial policy with subsidies and tax breaks. And he showed how even in the United States, it was Alexander Hamilton, the first secretary of the treasury who created the treasury. It was Alexander Hamilton who created a system of protectionist industrial development that ironically used to be known as the American school that relied on protection, state protection of infant industries. So the government can help create industries that could become internationally competitive. So these infant industries are not cannibalized by foreign competition in their early stages. And also the government provided public credit, very favorable credit to these industries and massively invested in infrastructure. So this is exactly how China developed, the United States developed, Japan developed. It's how South Korea developed. It's how the so-called Asian tigers developed. It's how Germany developed. It was through significant state in intervention. The economist Hajun Chang published another book that explains this in detail titled Bad Samaritans, The Myth of Free Trade and the Secret History of Capitalism. And he shows how the wealthy capitalist countries that developed through significant state-led development, they then lectured countries in the global south and told them that they have to free their markets and end government intervention in the economy in order to develop, which is, of course, the exact opposite of what they did. And that was referred to as kicking away the ladder. So in both of these books, he explains this important history. So the reason that China has been able to develop at an incredible pace, unlike many of these countries in the global south that are trapped in cycles of dependency and have been unable to create a significant manufacturing sector. Like, for instance, I showed earlier the data on Haiti and Sudan and Honduras and India and the Philippines, which China per capita used to be poorer than all of those countries. And yet now it's more prosperous. Well, the reason that China was able to do this and didn't have to resort to imperialism and war and exploitation and slavery like the Western capitalist economies did and Japan as well, which was a colonial power. The reason that China was able to do it is because of its unique socialist model. Those are the most important parts of the Chinese economic model. Now, I mentioned that it's important not only to look at GDP, but also to look at the economic sectors that make up GDP. In China, in 2023, the industrial sector made up roughly one third of the entire economy, about 32 percent of GDP and financial intermediation made up around eight percent with agriculture and construction each around seven percent and real estate around six percent. Now, let's compare that to the United States and we can see how the U.S. economy is structured in a very different way from the Chinese economy. I'm looking here at data from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, and you can see that this is these are the different industries in the U.S. economy as a percentage of GDP, and it looks at their value added. And you can see that by far the biggest sector in the U.S. economy is known as the fire sector, finance, insurance and real estate. 
And this represents rent extraction. It doesn't represent actual production in the real economy. This is the financialized rent rent seeking sector. And you can see that in 2020, it made nearly 22% of GDP. And in 2022, it makes up 21% of GDP. Now, compare that to manufacturing, which is half of it. Manufacturing as value added as a share of US GDP is just around 10% consistently and has been pretty much around there. And actually, it's decreasing slightly over time. In 2017, manufacturing made up around 11% of US GDP. And in 2022, it made up just around 10%. So this is the heavily financialized US economy. We can see that construction represents around 4% of US GDP. Agriculture only represents around 1% of US GDP. You can also see that professional and business services, which include things like legal services and accounting and management of companies, you know, the you know, administrative bureaucrats, they represent in, in private companies, by the way, they represent around 13% of US GDP. So that's massive overhead. And then finally, US government spending represents around 11% of GDP. But again, the main point to take away here is that the fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate make up 21% of US GDP, whereas manufacturing makes up only around 10% of US GDP. Now let's briefly go back and look at the data on China's GDP, and we can see that industrial manufacturing makes up 32% compared to just 10% in the US, and the finance sector makes up only around 8% of China's GDP. And I should emphasize that in China, the finance sector is almost entirely state-owned. The largest banks are all public state-owned banks. They're not private banks like in the US. And China's socialized banking system is used to provide very favorable loans in order to serve the industrial sector, in order to serve manufacturing in the real economy and not pump up bubbles of financial speculation. So what we can see in these comparisons here is that as China has become an industrial superpower, it has coincided with the US economy's turn toward neoliberal economics, this free market fundamentalism with less and less state intervention in the economy. And this has meant that the US economy has become more and more de-industrialized. And instead of focusing on manufacturing of goods that people want for their lives, the US economy has been very heavily dominated by the service sector, which makes up around 60% of the US economy. And by the way, it's not just the United States. Europe is also deindustrializing at breakneck speed. I explained this in a previous video, which I will link to in the description below, showing how the new Cold War that the West is waging against Russia and the economic war against Russia and the sanctions on Russia have severely damaged the economies of Europe and in particular the industrial sector. But that's a whole other long conversation. The point to take away is that as the Western economies have moved toward a neoliberal economic model based on financial speculation, China has become the world's industrial superpower through a socialist model that is based on the real economy and not pumping up bubbles of financial speculation. Now, China, when it implemented the reform and opening up starting in 1978, I mentioned that it did not abandon socialism, but what it did abandon is the complete planning of every sector of the economy. This is the Soviet model of a complete command economy. Instead, what China did is it allowed some parts of private industry, although again, the, the most important strategic sectors of the economy, the commanding heights remained under state control, but China instead, instead of planning everything, which is very inefficient, instead China focused planning on the most important strategic sectors of the economy, and in particular, the tech sector. Now, one thing that China did not abandon, the Soviet Union had done, is five-year plans. Every five years, the Chinese government, the Communist Party, releases a five-year plan that outlines how it wants to develop its economy in the subsequent years. The 14th five-year plan was released in 2021. 
And if you look at it on the Chinese government website, you can see that the first goal was to improve quality and effectiveness of development, maintain sustained and healthy economic growth, setting targets for economic growth, trying to make sure that labor productivity grows faster than GDP, and trying to maintain unemployment very low and reduce inflation to keep prices stable. And the second goal in China's five-year plan was to pursue innovation-driven development and accelerate the modernization of the industrial system. And again, this is the point that I've been emphasizing throughout this analysis today and how important industrialization and manufacturing production has been for China. China's research and development R&D spending will increase by more than 7% per year, which is expected to account for a higher percentage of GDP than during the 13th five-year plan period. And the 2021 five-year plan emphasized that in pursuing economic growth, China will continue to prioritize the development of the real economy. They always emphasize that, the real economy, not financial speculation. And that includes upgrading the industrial base modernizing industrial chains and keeping the share of manufacturing in the economy basically stable while also transforming and upgrading traditional industries and strengthening strategic emerging industries. So I mentioned that China still uses elements of planning in its economy and in 2020 the Chinese government announced a new plan for the development of new energy vehicles from 2021 to 2035. So the Communist Party recognized that there were key industries that China wanted to prioritize its development of and used government industrial policy to significantly advance in those industries. And in particular, new energy, that is renewable energy, was at the top of the list. And this is how China has become the world's largest car producer in just a few years. So I mentioned that the Chinese government announced this plan for new energy vehicles in 2020 to start in 2021. Well, you can see that starting in 2021, China went from exporting almost no cars to overtaking in just three years, South Korea, Germany, and Japan to become the world's number one car exporter in 2023 and of course a significant part of that is electric vehicles china is breaking world records and has become the top producer of electric vehicles on earth and in 2023 the chinese car manufacturer byd overtook elon musk's tesla as the top electric car seller on earth and of course, BYD has been provided a lot of state support through industrial policy. This is also ironic because a decade before, Elon Musk, the billionaire oligarch, he literally laughed about Chinese cars and he claimed that Chinese cars would never be competitive. Well, they just overtook Tesla. So once again, going back to the Chinese development model, the idea that China simply freed the markets and restored capitalism in 1978 and that's what made it so rich and, and helped to develop. That's not true at all. Anyone who's saying that knows absolutely nothing about the Chinese economy and how China has developed so quickly. If all it took for a poor country to develop and become prosperous were to adopt capitalism in the free market, why is it that the vast majority of poor countries on earth are capitalist and they're still poor? Why is it that the vast majority of poor countries have implemented free market neoliberal policies for decades and they have been in economic stagnation? Why is it that China had a lower GDP per capita in 1990 than Haiti, Sudan, Honduras, India, and the Philippines, all of which are capitalist countries, and yet capitalism did not make them prosperous, but China became prosperous supposedly through capitalism in the free market? The answer is obviously because China did not simply adopt capitalism. China created a unique socialist model. It's not the Soviet model, it's different, but it's a socialist model that used state-led development in order to become the world's manufacturing superpower. Let me continue explaining the other parts of the Chinese developmental model. Now, China did allow foreign direct investment. However, 
FDI was tightly regulated in order to fund productive industries in the real economy, not bubbles of speculation. And one of the top goals of foreign direct investment was technology transfer in order to move up the value chain. And the Chinese government prioritized FDI with joint ventures. So foreign investors who wanted to invest in China, frequently they were encouraged to form joint ventures with Chinese firms. And therefore, China was able to develop its own companies like BYD, like Huawei, like Xiaomi, like many other firms. China was able to develop them instead of simply allowing foreign corporations to exploit low paid Chinese workers. So today I've been talking a lot about the global industrial structure or the value chain. What do I mean by that? Well, the best way to think about this is to create a kind of pyramid and you can look at the way that industrial manufacturing is structured around the world and you can see that at the bottom of the pyramid, representing the majority, are the very labor intensive industries in which they're largely dominated by low paid workers, largely in the global south. You know, in this global capitalist system, you have the advanced industrialized capitalist nations that try to exploit the low paid workers concentrated in the global south in very labor intensive industries like, for instance, textiles, right? Making, you know, clothes, making T-shirts, sweaters, sneakers. OK, so at the bottom, you have largely developing countries. India and China is still it still has a lot of manufacturing in this labor intensive sector. However, China has moved up the value added chain at basically every single level of the structure. This pyramid is not purely scientific. It's a way of thinking about the economic structure of the world. But as you move up the pyramid, you have less labor intensive forms of manufacturing and more capital intensive forms of manufacturing. So you often have higher paid workers, more skilled labor. And as you move up the pyramid, China is at every single level of the pyramid. As you move into the high tech sector, you can see that it's largely dominated by the, the rich imperialist countries that developed through colonialism, like the United States, Europe, Japan, also South Korea, which doesn't have a colonial history, is the only other example along with China that has moved out of being a very poor, underdeveloped country and become a significant industrial power. Of course, South Korea's population is much smaller than China's. And as the economist Ha Jun Chang showed, he's of course from South Korea, South Korea developed industrially through significant state intervention in the economy and industrial policy. It also South Korea's economy is dominated by a small handful of large corporate monopolies known as the Chaebols, which are controlled by families which are very close to the, the South Korean government and the political class. So it's not even very clear where the, the South Korean government begins and ends and where the companies begin and end. But the point is, is that as Ha Jun Chang showed, South Korea developed this industry through state industrial policy and also it got very favorable loans from the United States throughout the Cold War as a U.S. ally. Anyway, the point is, is if you look at this pyramid and as you go up, China is now in every single stage of production, including the most high tech sector. And we're talking about things like semiconductors, quantum computing, artificial intelligence. And those are the sectors that the U.S. is trying to destroy in China by waging a tech war. The United States has been imposing sanctions on Chinese high tech companies, also in sectors like 5G Internet, for instance, and now 6G Internet, which is being developed by Chinese companies like Huawei, which also have a very close link to the state and have gotten a lot of support through industrial policy. So this is one of the most important factors explaining why the United States is waging this tech war, trade war, economic war against China. It's because the United States does not want China to be a competitor at the highest levels of high tech intensive industrial production. Instead, when the U.S. normalized relations with China in the 1970s, when the U.S. allowed China to join the World Trade Organization in 2001, the very arrogant idea in the West was that China would always remain at the bottom of the pyramid, maybe moving up a little bit 
in terms of industrial production. And the idea was that China would only ever produce toys and toasters and trinkets and low value added products for Western consumers. And the idea was that China would not be allowed to move up significantly to higher value added forms of production, less labor intensive and more capital intensive. But as I've been explaining here in great detail, through the unique Chinese socialist system, China has been able to move up every single level of the pyramid of the global value chain. So through concerted government industrial policy, China has created large complex supply chains, the largest and most complex supply chains on earth, and they are located inside China with basically every single level of production and distribution. Furthermore, China has developed this way through massive government investment in infrastructure, which reduces the costs of production and transportation, significant spending on education, especially science and engineering, which develops the human capital needed to move up the value chain of production. And now China is the world's leader in many advanced technologies. China has also invested a lot in healthcare and other social services, keeping them very low cost in order to reduce the costs of production. China also always remained it capital controls and prevented its capital account from being fully open, from being fully liberalized. And what this did is it prevented capital flight. It also limited options for investment in productive industries in the real economy, not speculation. So there are capitalists in China, but they do not form a coherent political class. They do not have political power. It's the Communist Party that controls the policy of the Chinese government, and they allowed some Chinese capitalists to emerge, but only under very specific conditions, and the government disciplined them and made sure that they invested their capital in the productive real economy, not in financialization and speculation, which is what we've seen in the Western financialized neoliberal economies, which have led to crashy, crashes like the dot-com bubble that burst in the early 2000s, and then, of course, the great financial crisis of 2008-2009. Now, furthermore, a few other policies. The Chinese government has often been given a so-called golden share in some of the most important companies, so they don't implement decisions that go against the interests of the Chinese people. The Communist Party has also maintained cadres, placing them in some important private companies to make sure that they implement policies that go along with national interests of the Chinese people. While Chinese wages have significantly risen, and as China has developed, that has meant that its labor is now much better compensated. So it's no longer very low paid labor like in other parts of the global south. So in order to maintain competitiveness, China has also significantly invested in robotization, in automation of manufacturing. This is also going to help as the Chinese population ages and faces demographic issues like many countries in the West as well. And despite having a chronic current account surplus, so significantly exporting much more than it imports, China prevented its currency, the yuan or the renminbi, from being very overvalued because Often what happens is when a country exports much more than it imports, its currency becomes overvalued, which decreases the competitiveness of its exports and encourages the country to buy more and more imports to balance that trade. Instead, China has made sure that the yuan is not overvalued, which allows its exports to maintain competitive internationally. And the other side of that is that China used its massive trade surplus and its export-oriented model to move up the supply chain by using the foreign currencies like dollars it received, and instead of spending them primarily on the import of luxury goods, instead it, it invested those dollars in capital goods, in technologies, in machine parts, once again, in order to move up the supply chain and move toward more capital-intensive forms of production. So all of this explains how China became the world's largest manufacturing power, or as the mainstream economist Richard Baldwin put in his research paper over at Europe's Center for Economic Policy Research, 
He said that China is now the world's sole manufacturing superpower. I have shown in great detail how China did this through its unique socialist model, through government industrial policy, not simply through restoring capitalism and freeing the market. Anyone who says that is completely ignorant or they're simply trying to convince you of a political argument that is based on their ideology, not actually based on evidence. Now, before I conclude here, I wanna make one final point that is from this research paper by this mainstream economist in Europe. He pointed out that the flip side of China's world historic industrial development is what he describes as, quote, a remarkable historical world-shaping asymmetry in supply chain reliance between China and other major manufacturing countries. Politicians, that is in the West, may wish to decouple their economies from China, but the data suggest that decoupling would be difficult, slow, expensive, and disruptive, especially to G7 manufacturers. He included a very interesting chart that shows how the United States is very heavily reliant on the import of products from China for its own industrial production. And on the flip side, China is slightly more reliant. So what this means is that it would be very difficult for the US to decouple economically from China without doing further damage to its own industrial base, which the US has already done, as I showed earlier, through decades of neoliberal policies and deindustrialization. And the other part, the flip side of this asymmetry is that China is still reliant on US purchases of its manufactured goods. However, in recent years, China has become much less reliant on the US for purchasing its manufactured goods. And the reliance that China has, the dependency that China has in the US economy is decreasing, whereas the US dependency on China is increasing over time. So what does this mean? It means that the US idea of decoupling economically from China is completely absurd. If the US wants to do it, it's going to cause significant economic damage to the United States, and that's gonna cause a lot of political instability. It's going to lead to extreme inflation. It's likely going to lead to a decline in living standards. And that, of course, is going to lead to a political crisis because economics and politics are inextricably linked. And on the other hand, the more the US sanctions China and wages a trade war and a tech war in China, ironically, this is making China more self-sufficient and less dependent on the United States. And China instead, through its massive infrastructure project worldwide, the Belt and Road Initiative, China is helping to develop other economies, which can be other trading partners and developing new trade routes, not only seaborne trade routes that the United States could try to block off with its Navy if there's a war, but also land routes through the Belt and Road Initiative and the road in the Belt and Road is a reference to the New Silk Road. So China is creating new trade routes and new trading partners, and it's no longer as dependent on the US economy. So what's quite comical at the end of the day is that if the US is serious about waging a new Cold War on China and decoupling from the Chinese economy, it's actually going to be significantly easier for China to, to decouple from the US than for the US to decouple from China. And why is that? Once again, it's because China is the world's industrial superpower. On that note, I'm going to conclude here. My name is Ben Norton. I am the editor-in-chief of Geopolitical Economy Report. If you like the work that we do here, please like and subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. It helps to promote our material and the algorithm. If you prefer listening to these videos as a podcast, you can check out the Geopolitical Economy Report podcast. And if you really like the work that we do, please consider supporting us. We are entirely independent. There are a few ways you can do that. If you go to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support, the best way to provide support to us is you can go over to patreon.com slash 
slash geopolitical economy and become a donor there. We are entirely independent. We rely exclusively on donations from viewers and listeners like you. We have no institutional support. We have no big donors. I want to thank everyone for joining me for this deep dive today in this analysis. I'm Ben Norton. I will see you all next time.